Good afternoon, and welcome to our Good Friday service. I think most symbols in our world have some sort of meaning, right? But more often than not, the symbol becomes a placeholder, and over time, the meaning gets lost. For instance, do you know what this is? I mean, you recognize it, right? It's the medical symbol. We see it on ambulances and hospital signs. We'll even see it on the name badges of medical staff. It's called the caduceus. But why this symbol? <laughs> I mean, have you ever wondered why the medical symbol is a snake? Snakes typically don't have good reputations. Well, the answer lies deep in the Bible with Moses around 1400 BC. Moses used a bronze serpent erected on a pole to cure the Israelites of snake bites. Yep. In Numbers chapter 21, we find the Israelites doing what they do best, complaining. But to be fair, the desert is not a fun place to be, and 40 years is a long time to wander. The people go to Moses and they say things like, why did you bring us out into the desert? Was it only to die? There's nothing to eat. There's no Chick-fil-A out here. There's no Whataburger. Just, just manna. We eat that every single day. And there's barely any water. And verse 6 says that God responds negatively to this. He sends poisonous snakes. They bite the people. And many of the people die. Well, by verse 7, the people change their tune. They go to Moses and they say, we have sinned. We've spoken against the Lord. We've spoken against you. Please intercede for us. Pray to the Lord that the snakes will go away. So Moses does that. And then in verse 8, it says, then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, please don't ask me how this worked. I have no idea. But the symbol of the bronze serpent remained through time. It was kept alive by the Israelites as a reminder of God's deliverance, but also his punishment. And there's no actual healing power in this statue, right? It was just faith. It was faith in a saving God it was faith in the creator of the world. Nonetheless, the symbol eventually becomes an idol, and the caduceus became an object of worship instead of worshiping the one that it was about. And then in 2 Kings, in the days of Hezekiah, the people started burning incense to the brass serpent, and so the king broke it to pieces. The Bible doesn't go out to explain the connection between snakes and healing, or how looking at a bronze snake healed people of snake bites. The emphasis was on a God and his love and mercy towards a people who had badmouthed him earlier. God says, look up and live. And the people who had previously been unresponsive to him, they now believed, they now obeyed. But there's more to this story than just this isolated act of salvation. In the Gospel of John, the raised snake serves as a foreshadowing of the crucifixion and the salvation that comes from Jesus when he was raised up on a pole. John chapter 19 says, so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. 
So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture which said, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his, mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, he said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Earlier, in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Just as the Israelites looked up to a serpent for healing from snake bites, Jesus says we can look up to him for eternal healing. Tonight, on Good Friday, the message is clear. Look up and live. Whoever looks to the raised Jesus will live. What exactly does it mean, though, to look up to Jesus? Are we talking about admiring him as a great man? Are we talking about holding him up as a role model? Are we saying that we should elevate him as an important person in history? I mean, I think Jesus is pretty looked up to. He was a great man. People would say that he was an outstanding moral teacher. He is also the founder of Christianity. I don't think uh, it would be very easy to find somebody who would speak negatively about Jesus. I think no matter who you are or what you believe, it'd be rare for someone to say a negative or mean thing about Jesus. But John says that's not enough. He says we should look to Jesus. The book of John also says that it's a matter of believing. The next part of this passage says that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, we read John 3.16 so much. We've committed it to memory. We see it everywhere. And yet, I think there are elements to it that we just skim right by because we've heard it so many times. It says, so that everyone who believes in him, believes. Most recently, Gallup, they did a poll, they found that 81% of Americans expressed belief when asked a very simple question, do you believe in God? 81% of America said yes. That sounds great. But even then, what we say we believe in and then how we live are two different things. I know this from my own life. I suspect you do too. So what does it mean to believe? I mean, first of all, belief has to have an object. Belief has an object. I know that sounds really abstract, but you gotta, you gotta go along with this uh, with me. I think it's important. What I'm saying is that contrary to popular opinion, Faith, in and of itself, is useless. Unless there is sound object to have faith in. For instance, I can have faith in a chair, right? I could have faith in a chair, and we, I could say, this chair will hold me. So the object of my faith is the chair. But what if there was some sort of anti-chair prowler? that came in one night when no one was here and they removed all the bolts from the chair, would the chair still be worthy of my faith? But what if I said, no, it doesn't really matter if the chair can support me. What really matters is that I just have some kind of belief in a chair. There's no real right or wrong belief when it comes to chairs. You say, you know what, you see it one way, I see it the other. Who's to say who's right and who's wrong? But the scriptures make it very clear that 
there is a solid object to our faith. The Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In the wilderness, the people were dying because of their rebellion, and they needed help. They turned back to the Lord who had rescued them in the past, and when he told them to look at the snake, they believed in him, and they, they did it. And as absurd as that instruction sounds, they still trusted in the Lord enough to follow his instruction. They believed in him. They believed in his word. Likewise, the book of John says that the object of our belief is the God who loved the world so much that he sent his son. The son who was raised up. So when we say that salvation comes by believing, we're not talking about an abstract belief. We're talking about believing in a specific God and the sending of his son Jesus to the world to be raised up on behalf of each person in the world. Belief has an object and belief has a result. Belief has a result. In both the Numbers passage and John chapter 3, there are marked results for the people who believe. And in both cases, the, re the, the, the result is salvation. It's, it's rescue, right? In Numbers 21, when the Israelites believe, what happens? They are saved from snake bites. They're saved from death. In John chapter 3, those who believe are saved from what? Eternal damnation, because the, re the result is eternal life. Look at what else John, uh, the book of John says. Verse 16 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the same, in the name of the only Son of God. That's pretty harsh, right? Because it says those who do not believe, according to the next verse, already stand condemned. In other words, disbelief is so real. Jesus says that even though they have not yet stood before judgment, right? Their disbelief has already condemned them. Now, someone might be saying, well, that sounds pretty abstract to me. H how can you say that eternal life is something that's uh, a result? How is eternal life a tangible result? Well, there's more to it. The term eternal life doesn't just refer to the future. Look at how the Message Bible says it. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. You know, that now that the spring days are a little warmer, I'm back outside walking more in the morning. You know, through that long winter, I took a break. I just couldn't get the motivation to abandon my pajamas, abandon my coffee, and go out into the brisk air. So a few weeks ago, I went from sitting at my desk to almost uh, getting my 10,000 steps in every single day. And of course, right away, my legs started to hurt. Now that I've been doing it more and more, I feel great. I feel a lot better than I did through those lethargic winter months. What does exercise do? Well, it does two things. It extends your life, right? But it also improves the quality of your life. Eternal life with God is exactly the same thing. You see, when people put their faith in Jesus, their lives change. Now, I say changed. I didn't say perfected, right? And what that means is we begin to live and think in a brand new way. We begin to see life from a different perspective. Suddenly, we no longer want to live the way that we used to or even live for the things that we used to live for. There's another aspect of belief, and it's right here 
still in John chapter 3, but it's a little bit more uh, grammatical. In John 3, verse 15, 16, and 18, it denotes an ongoing belief, meaning it's not a one-time belief. What the verse actually says is those who keep on believing. So true belief is not a once-in-a-lifetime event. If it were, then it probably really wasn't true in the first place. Sadly, there are probably millions of people running around thinking that they are saved because one day a long time ago, they walked down the center aisle of a church, or one day a long time ago when they were young, they had their first communion, or one day a long time ago they were baptized, or one day a long time ago they said the sinner's prayer. Instead, John 3.21 says, but whoever does, not, does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen by his works have been carried out in God. You know, the Swedish Christians in the early covenant churches, they used to greet each other by saying, brother, sister, are you alive? Brother, are you alive? Sister, are you alive? Which meant, how was your walk with Christ? Are you alive? Are you growing? Is believing in Jesus making a difference in your current life? And this is what the book of John is asking the readers. To look up to Jesus, who was raised on a pole, to believe in him, and consequently to live for him. Not just nominally, but to really experience a new, improved healthy, eternal life. The Israelites knew they were about to die for those snake bites. And when they looked at the snake that was lifted up on the pole, suddenly it gave them new life. Can you imagine the feeling of gratitude? A whole new outlook, a whole new direction. As a young man, the famed British pastor, Charles Spurgeon, struggled with his faith. And one Sunday morning, he set off for a Baptist church to find some answers. And there was a snowstorm, and he ended up stopping at a small Methodist church instead. The minister inside was absent because he had a cold. <laughs> and a layman was preaching from the pulpit. The layman read Isaiah 45, 22, Turn to me and be saved all you ends of the earth. He looked right at Charles Spurgeon and it seemed, Spurgeon said, that he was looking straight into his soul. And the preacher said, young man, you look very miserable <laughs> and you will always be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey this text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Young man, Look to Jesus Christ. You have nothing to do but to look and to live. That was the moment Charles Spurgeon became a true believer. And Good Friday says the same thing to you. Look. Look up and live. Sin and death came into this world through a look. You know, in Genesis chapter 3, it says that Adam and Eve saw the fruit and they said it was pleasing to the eye. Death and sin entered this world through a look. And tonight, Good Friday reminds us that we can be saved by a look. It seems simple, but it works. Salvation happens when we turn from sin and look to Jesus believing that he will save us. Jesus declared in John's gospel, when I am lifted up from this earth, I will draw all people to myself. And that look brings life. Let's pray together. Lord God, on this eve before Easter, we stand at the foot of the cross with your son who gave his life you sent the perfect lamb to die in our place, to have his blood shed for each one. 
Lord, may the good news ring out this good Friday. That one has only to look and to live, to believe in your Son, and that they too will be rescued from sin, rescued from death. As families get ready to dress up nice and to hunt for Easter eggs and to take pictures and to go out to brunch with Grandma, all the fun things that we enjoy on Easter, let us not forget, Lord. Let us not forget that this is all a celebration because first your son had to die. And the weight of that, the cost of that, sits on every one of us. And yet the good news is our sin, our past, is wiped away and forever forgotten because of your Son's great gift. Amen. We want to remind you that we have three Easter services Sunday morning. We have a 7 o'clock service that it's going to be at the Yacht Club flagpole. We'll have a couple hundred seats for you, but if you would like to bring your own lawn chair and a cozy blanket and some coffee, go ahead. We would let you know that if you walk outside getting ready to come and you notice that there is rain falling down from the sky, we will not be there. The the service will be canceled if it is raining. But we do have two services at the church sanctuary, both at the top of the hour, one at 9 o'clock and one at 11 o'clock. They're both completely identical. Please choose the one that works the best for you and your family. Have a blessed Easter.